This morning's reading is from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 18. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Again, we encourage you to read along. This is 2 Corinthians, and so next week we'll be looking at Galatians. There we go. What's the, next week we'll be looking at Galatians as we walk through. We encourage you to, as you're reading on your own, think about what passage would you think sums up the book. Remember, we're not trying to pick the most famous or well-known passage. Sometimes it happens, but we are trying to pick... Um, I'm trying to pick a passage that I think sums up the gist of that particular book. And uh, so it's been, it's been great. We already talked about the next series should be everything I wish we had covered the first time around. Um, but we're still working through uh, the Bible now, which has been uh, great. We look like maybe we'll end sometime um, towards the end of the spring. Uh, Second Corinthians, uh, again, is a somewhat of a follow-up to this, this church in Corinth that Paul has been working with. Uh, same people similar, different kind of problems. He's still working with them. They aren't perfect. That should give all of us uh, comfort in knowing that even 2,000 years ago, even under the the leadership of the Apostle Paul himself, churches still were not perfect places. Uh, And today in particular, the passage that I picked, I I feel like Paul's trying to make uh, a very uh, powerful statement. Actually, I think he's trying to make a very bold statement statement. Uh, and I was thinking about uh, just what it means to be bold. I remember uh, the idea of what, when, when a flavor is considered bold or very powerful, you can have two people, different people who have very different opinions. So there's a restaurant in Tyson's, um, uh, an Indian restaurant in Tyson's that I took uh, someone to uh, in our church. And they said, oh, I love Indian food. I love spicy and kick. And I said, great, let's go. And we went and uh, he ordered this particular dish. And uh, for him, the dish was so hot <laughs> He, he started to almost gag and asked for all of their coconut milk items they had on hand and started downing it and tried to eat all the rice. He couldn't, it was just a little bite. And he said, oh, oh I, I don't think I can take it. I'm like, oh, I didn't know if that bad. Same restaurant a week later, I took someone else in our church and I was like, what do you want? He's like, I want something spicy. And I said, Did I know what you need to get. You need to get this item. And he goes, I, I'll get it. So he ordered it and he ate it. And I'm like, I'm waiting. When's it going to happen? He's like, yeah, it was okay. <laughs> Not even a, the other guy sweating, drinking coconut milk, everything he could, dying. And this other guy was like, ah, you know, I've had hot dogs harder. It was crazy. Well, Paul is going to argue that our hope should be bold. But he's also going to argue that when you try to replace Christ What you're actually doing is putting a veil on hope. And Paul wants us to unveil hope. So the message today is really going to be about unveiling hope as Paul helps us understand. Because what was happening was in the church at this time, there were people coming in and telling people who are former Jewish believers and people who maybe even weren't, maybe Greek people came to faith, telling them, you know, we need to be more like the Old Testament in our faith. And so they're saying, we know what, what we're being taught by the apostles, but we need to kind of embrace more of what we saw uh, in the Old Testament, that kind of a lifestyle, which the apostles said things are different now because of Christ. And so Paul is the moment making this grand argument saying, well, we can't do both. And he's going to argue that when you try to do anything to the gospel, you're really hurting yourself in the end. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming to us. Father, thank you for sending the Son. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would reach to every child, that they would not know a moment 
without you as your Savior, for the, our children, maybe adult children who've wandered, we pray you would bring them back. And we pray in the Holy Spirit that at the, during this time, through your word, we would die to sin and become more alive to you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, digging in, Paul, again, is trying to make a very big assertion as to what should be going on. Now, there is a, actually, I was going to use this illustration a while ago, and the TV show um, just had their big finale uh, a couple weeks ago, and they used my illustration. So if you hear it, you can be like, it sounds familiar. It's because it's from that show, but it, it's an old illustration. It goes back literally uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of years, a thousand years, but it's called Thesis' Boat, and you know exactly what TV show just used it, but I was going to use it before the TV show, so don't, don't judge me. <laughs> but uh, the, the thought is this. Theseus um, was a Greek king. Uh, did a whole bunch of great things, and they had his boat in Athens. They were keeping his boat, and they were keeping it stable, and they were going to keep it forever. And every time a piece of wood on the boat rotted, they would replace that with a brand new, better piece of wood. And so the thought is this. If over time, every single piece of wood on the boat has been replaced, is it still Thesis' boat? Is it something else? And I think what Paul is posing is that if you take the gospel and replace it with anything, even if it looks and feels and sounds better, it's not the same thing. And what you're left with is not the gospel at all. Even though you might think a part needs to be replaced, <laughs> that was what often happens with the message of Christ. It doesn't apply now. It doesn't apply to me. I'm going to change it. Paul is saying we can't do that at all. So let's look at verse 12 from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Paul is talking about the hope we have in the gospel. And he's saying now, if you come in and say, what we have now in Christ needs to be replaced and go back to kind of what it was, there's a problem with that. But he's saying, we don't do that. Our hope, because it's based on the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, that he has come, we are bold. Our hope is bold. Paul's making a tremendous statement here. He is saying, not only do you need hope, but your hope should be bold. Think about it. The reason we have hope is because we need something bold to let us know there's something greater. If hope wasn't bold, then what would be the point of hoping for something? We have a great hope because we know something great is coming. If you were hoping for something small, you wouldn't really even be hoping for it. We hope because there's a need. If you didn't want anything to change, you wouldn't be hoping for anything. And Paul is trying to argue that what is coming in Christ is big and is needed. And if Christ is who he says he is and did what he said he did and is going to do what he said he's going to do, then indeed your hope should be bold. The gospel declares, demands that your hope be bold. The gospel says, the message of Christ says you have a hope. And that hope is not weak. That hope is bold. That hope is bold. How bold is it? Well, Paul's argument is that his hope that we have in the gospel, this hope is bolder than Moses' hope. Bolder than Moses. Do you understand? That's like going for the jugular, right? Talk to someone who's from New England, it'd be like attacking the Red Sox. Saying that our, our hope is even bolder than what Moses could hope for, is Paul saying, let's just get to the heart of the matter. If you think that somehow claiming uh, 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 this Jewish life that we've 
We're supposed to now be free from talking about the laws and the regulations. If you think that's going to give you hope, then Paul is saying that I have something to tell you. The hope we have in Christ is even bolder than the hope you had in Moses himself, even greater than the hope Moses had. So Paul is trying to make a very, very big sweeping argument. Why? Because Moses is arguably one of the most important characters of the entire Old Testament. He, is, he was the one who brought the law. You could argue that Moses, David was the promised king, but you could argue Moses had a greater impact in all of the Old Testament. And so Paul goes straight for the top dog in the Old Testament, Moses. And he says, we have a bolder hope in the gospel than everyone in the Old Testament had in what Moses brought. That is the theological mic drop happening that Paul is saying. He's saying, let's let's see what happens when these two views face off. Let's read verse 13 to 15. Not like Moses, again, we have a bold hope. Not like Moses, right? He's saying Moses does not have the same hope that we have, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil is over their hearts. Moses is talking, Paul's talking about Moses and and how Moses interacted with the glory of God. And there's a great passage, there's a great moment when when Moses is interacting with God on the mountain. He's like, I I just, can I see you in your glory? And God's like, no, I'll let it pass by you. And as it does, the glory of God shines on Moses' face. Moses doesn't even realize this. And what happens is he comes down, his face is radiating it, and they need to lower the veil down over his face. When he's speaking, he takes it off. When he's not, he drops it back down. When he goes in to talk to God, he takes it off. But every other time, it's lowered back down. And Paul is going to talk about this veil. This veil and what's happening underneath the veil and this glory is proof that what we have in Christ is better than everything you had in Moses for a couple of reasons. The biggest thing he wants us to know, that passage is in Exodus 33, Exodus 34. Here's a passage in Exodus 34, 33 that again talks about, again, Moses' face and the glory and the veil behind it. But what Here's their theological 10 cents word. Uh, it's ineffectual. What Paul is saying is that if your hope in seeing God in all of his glory is in what Moses brought down off of the mountain, the law, then you have an ineffectual hope. It's ineffectual at bringing about Righteousness. It's ineffectual. It's not going to do what it is you want it to do. And this is a big deal. What Paul is arguing basically here, if your hope is based on what you think the law was doing through Moses, then what you have is an ineffectual hope. And what that means is your hope can actually get worse, (laughs) not better. Your hope can get worse. And he lays out a couple of things. So before this passage we read in chapter... um, Uh, verses uh, 12 through 18, Paul built up to this argument. And he leans, starts with talking about kind of what we don't have in the Old Testament with Moses, what it's missing. So here is 2 Corinthians 5, 3, 6 through 7. God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, the letters referring to the commandments to Moses, the Spirit's returning, returning to Christ in the new covenant, for the latter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which is being brought to an end. So just to unpack that a little bit, what it's saying, there's a lot that that's saying there. So you can keep the verse up, but there are a couple of things where I'll go back to it. But a couple of things that this is saying that what they had in Moses, this is so important again, because Paul is saying, listen, we're living in a world with real problems. If you only have a very weak hope, It is not going to get you through these issues. 
We, right now, 2021, we're living through some significant stuff in our own personal lives, your marriages, the world, from politics to your finances, to those of you who are single, those of you who are widowed, you're dealing with uh, widowed. Some of you are dealing with significant issues. Should I get married? How's my marriage doing? What am I supposed to do when I retire? What am I doing with my body failing, right? These are significant. If you don't have a real hope to get you through this, a real hope, not a fake hope, then you're destined for disappointment and hardship. And Paul is saying, you trusting in the Old Testament for your current hope doesn't make any sense for a couple of reasons. First, he says at the beginning there, he said that that hope they had in the Old Testament and that glory that was shining off Moses' face, it was just temporary. What was happening was the veil was there. The veil only came up when he was speaking, but what was guarding was the fact that that glory was actually diminishing. Moses' face was shining less and less each time. Why? He's saying it was temporary. That glory that Moses interacted with, that, that glory that we think about when we think the Old Testament, that's fading. It's going away. It's only temporary. Who wants a temporary hope? Who wants a hope that was good yesterday, but not any good today, right? You got your Pfizer shot a couple weeks ago, and you find out today it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> You're like, wait, that's not how I want it to happen. He's saying the hope, again, the glory that was there, it's fading because it was only supposed to be temporary. It was only supposed to be there to get you to Jesus. It's temporary. The veil represented this. Second, again, as the passage shows us, that hope fails. The Old Testament, the law of God, failed in what you're wanting it to do. It did not as verse 6 showed us, it does not actually transform your hearts. Remember, again, the ladder, etching it into carved stones, actually kills you. It's the spirit that you need to bring it to life. So you might be bragging about wanting to do hope the way they did in the Old Testament, but what is being argued by Paul is that what's happening in the Old Testament didn't actually change hearts. It didn't actually bring about the redemption of your heart, which is a big deal. You want your hearts to be changed. You always want your hearts to change, and it wasn't happening. Got it? So the first way it failed was temporary. The second way is that it failed in that it wasn't actually changing your hearts. It was hardening the hearts. Did you read that? Remember in 13 through 15? It's actually hardening our hearts. And then lastly, it's incomplete. So it's temporary, it fails, and it's incomplete. If you're putting your hope in what Moses did, then you put your hope in something that's temporary, something that fails. It doesn't even do what it's supposed to do, and it's incomplete. It doesn't even do everything it's supposed to do. Why is it incomplete? Because it doesn't fully save us as well. It was all, everything was pointing and waiting for something. And if you put your hope in something that was waiting for something, then you haven't put your hope in the right thing. And again, Paul is arguing that there are people who have now found Christ, and there are people trying to tell them, you need to go back into hoping in something else. And Paul is saying, wait, wait, wait. Why would you do that? And you can see the temptation and maybe many of us do that too. When we have, we're supposed to be putting our hope in Christ and what he has done. But situations dictate it's easier or we feel better about hope when it's based on something we've done with our own strength, right? To sum up these first few passages, usually humans feel most bold when our hope is based on something we like to control, right? Usually we have our most hope when it's over life that we control. So if it's our finances, we feel our most hope when we feel like we're in control of our finances, right? And you see this, when, when you're indebted to a lot of people, you lose a lot of hope. But when you're, the, fewer, the more debt you pay off, the more you feel like, ah, I have a little more hope. You feel like you're in control of things. 
So Paul is saying, for many of us, you feel like your most hope when it's based on your own works. Because the Old Testament, what they were telling them was to stop relying on what Christ has done, start relying, you need to start doing stuff. And that makes us all feel better to put our hope in what we're doing and not someone else. And Paul is saying to do that is like putting a veil over your hope. Think about this when it comes to your own faith. Do you have the most hope in your faith when you feel like you're doing your best for God? Do you feel at least hopeful for your faith when you're doing your worst with God? If you want to live like these people were wanting them to live, that's what that's like. That's not, that's not what it's like to live under the gospel. That's what it's like to live under the law. If your hope is based on how close you feel to God or what you have or haven't done, then you have a false hope. Your hope is temporary. Your hope is failed. And your hope is incomplete. So Paul wants to address that. Let's look at verse 16. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. If I were to sum up all of the New Testament, it would be, we have a faith on the gospel that's bold, and it would be also when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. When one turns to the Lord, that veil is removed. What is he talking about here? When someone turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Well, if us trying to base our faith on things we do is ineffectual, then this would be the opposite of that. This is what effectual hope looks like. The word effectual is a theological word, again, where God says it and it happens. One commentator put it this way, the God of the universe has summoned you and you will answer. Effectual calling means when he has called you to salvation, you are going to answer the call. That is the only way it works. You pick it up, the phone, right? You don't let it ring. He's going to call you. You're going to answer. A great passage that talks about God's effectiveness. There's a woman named Lydia in Acts 16, 14. And it says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was being said by Paul. When we're talking about something being effectual. It means God is going to make this happen. God is going to make this work. So what Paul is arguing is that if you're trying to reject what we've learned about Christ in the gospel, that it's through Christ, that it's really based on what you do, that is not effective. That's not going to work. But if you want a hope that will work, a hope that is real, a hope that will get you through what we're living in, then Paul is saying that you need to remove the veil. And what he's talking about is you need to remove the things that you think are based on your own works. Paul is saying you need to remove that veil where you think your standing with God is based on how good you're doing. That's not how it works. I'll give an example from marriage. Paul likes to do that too. So does Jesus. If you felt like your marriage was only as good as how you were acting towards your spouse, there might be days when you're like, I'm pretty sure she's left me because I've screwed up royally, right? But if you know your standing with your wife is because she has chosen to love you too, then you know that when you screw up, she's still going to be there. Paul is saying, which one do you want it based on, you or God? And when you trust in God, you're removing that veil. What you're saying is your hope is no longer based on you. Your hope is no longer based on me. Your hope is based on Christ. There's an interesting passage I thought about when Paul came to faith. Do you guys know the Apostle Paul himself who wrote this book? When he came to faith, he was in the middle of doing some pretty horrid things. He was tracking Christians down, trying to have them arrested, doing horrible things. And guess what happened? God called to him, and it was very effective. But you know what happened to Paul? When God called him, God put a veil of scales over his own eyes. And it says when Paul finally came to realizing who God was, the scales fell off, fell off of his face. 
And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and regained his sight, and he rose and was baptized when Paul could fully see who Christ was. The veil was removed from his heart. I just found that interesting, that the scales were kind of like veils that had been put over his face. And when Paul understood who Christ was, those scales fell as well. What Moses wanted to do most in the Old Testament was see the glory of God. Moses said, listen, this is going great. Can we solidify this best buddy friendship (laughs) by letting me see your glory? Let me see your glory. And that's when God says, no, you can't see my glory. I'll let it give you a glancing blow. You can't comprehend this. You can't see this. You can't know this. And what we have now in Christ is what Moses couldn't have is now because of Christ, we can comprehend God in all of his glory. Moses couldn't do that because there was no Christ yet. Christ hadn't risen from the grave. But now that Christ has risen from the grave, we can see God in all of his glory. We can contemplate, comprehend God in all of his glory. There's a, again, this idea of a veil being removed It's throughout Scripture. Remember, in the Old Testament, in the temple, what separated the human from the divine was a curtain, a super thick curtain that represents you cannot cross this because you are not worthy. And when Christ rose, when Christ was crucified and rose, that says that curtain and the temple was torn in two. Why? Because Christ has made something happen that couldn't happen. In the same way, Moses, of all the people who should have been able most to connect with God, couldn't because Christ hadn't risen. Now we can do. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, I think says it well. For God said, let light shine out of darkness. He has shown it in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have it all right there. The glory of God the face of Christ shining from darkness. This is what it means to have the veil removed. Having the veil removed realizes that, yes, our sins are great, and you can't do anything about them. And God demands righteousness, and you can't do anything about that either. But because of Jesus Christ, that righteousness is passed on to us. And when you see that your faith, the hope that drives your faith comes from what he did and no longer what you do, guess what happens to you too? The veil is removed. And when the veil is removed, do you know what happens to your hope? It becomes bold. You only need an ounce of of faith to get to heaven, just the smallest thing. Don't worry about that. God understands we fail and we mess up and our hope is not bold all the time. That's what the veil is. Understanding Christ is it for you. That's that, that little just prick you need that God gives you. But now to grow in that, to grow in that hope, for that hope to become bold enough in this life we're living in, that veil needs to be removed. And that's what happens. When we turn to God, that veil is removed. We find true boldness for our hope. We want you, I, as your pastor, want you to be followers of Christ who have a bold hope. A hope that says, yes, I'm going to heaven when I die. A bold hope that says, yes, Every other religion needs to know Jesus. A hope that says anyone who's trying to work their way to heaven misses the glory of God. A bold hope to stand yourself in the mirror and say, yeah, I mess up every day. 
I mess up at this every single day. So let's read verse 17 to 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Paul says, don't be veiled, be unveiled. And this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like, verse 16 was talking about, to be unveiled. Again, we're going to look at passages right before the ones we read. But again, through Christ, our faith is now unveiled. And he uses amazing words like freedom. Where the Spirit is, there is freedom. Have you ever been freed from something? It is an amazing feeling. To be freed from bondage, to be freed from a particular sin, to be freed from financial woes, to be freed from a medical issue, to be freed from, imagine a relationship where it's a horrible relationship, but it's been redeemed and you're freed from that animosity. It is such an amazing feeling to be freed. And he said, where the spirit is there, there is freedom because where the law is there, there is no freedom. You're just condemned. But where the spirit there is, there is freedom. There is transformation. We can behold God. These are wonderful words that Paul is talking about when we've been unveiled. So I read the first three things. If we're trying to lean on the Old Testament without Christ, our own works, then what we have is temporary, failed, and incomplete hope. But now Paul says what we have is the opposite of that. Again, looking at verses 17 through 18, the first thing it says is that our hope, if it's in the gospel in Christ, our hope is exceedingly great. It exceeds all expectations. It doesn't fail, it exceeds. 2 Corinthians 3.9 says this, For there is one glory in the ministry of condemnation, that's the old way, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. What we have in Christ exceeds anything that you could have had under your own power, anything you could have found in the Old Testament. Meaning this, what the Spirit is doing now in our hearts exceeds anything you could imagine. Next, our hope surpasses it surpasses everything you could have tried to do on your own. 2 Corinthians 3.10 says this, Indeed, in this one case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. What he's saying is this, if you thought what, Mo and you should, Moses had an amazing life. He did things that are amazing. But he's saying, listen, the glory that Moses encountered was fading. The, mo the glory that we receive that we encounter with Christ surpasses all all of that. So he's saying by comparison, what Moses had is nothing compared to what we have in Christ. It surpasses it in every way. And lastly, our hope is permanent. 2 Corinthians 3.11. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. What we have in Christ is completely permanent. The glory of Christ will never fade and never go away. So what does that mean? Again, we are at our most bold and most wrong when our hope is based on our works, on the works of someone else on this life, or the hopes of someone in this church. I can't count how many people have told me they are devastated by a famous um, uh, evangelist, uh, and um, uh, uh, apologist named Ravi, who found out his, his life was, turns out to be a, a morally failed. People's faith are diminished now because of his failure. As Christians, we don't put our faith in other Christians. We don't put our hope in other Christians. We don't put our hope in ourselves and our own works. We put our hope in Christ. We are at our most bold when we put our faith in ourselves and others, but that's when we are weakest. We are truly at our boldest hope, when our hope and faith is on Jesus Christ himself. So do you want a faith that's even bolder, a hope that's even bolder than what Moses had? Then put your hope in Jesus Christ. Remove the veil of trying to work your way to heaven. Remove that veil 
and put your glory, your hope completely on Christ. Trust the work, the hands of the Holy Spirit to work in your hearts to transform us into what we were meant to be. True image bearers of Christ with a glory that is not temporary. It does not fail. It is not incomplete. It exceeds, surpasses, and is permanent. Trust the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your son. Lord, help us to see that every time we try to base our hope on us or in others, Lord, we are throwing a veil over your glory. But it is to your glory, the more our hope is in you and what you've done, the more bold our hope becomes. So may our hope be completely based on what you have done for us on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.